Hi, I'm David Drubin from the University of California, Berkeley, where I'm a professor and department co-chair. In this second talk, I'd like to, to talk about how act and assembly forces are harnessed for endocytic trafficking in budding yeast. So this is a, a micrograph of the actin cytoskeleton of budding yeast. Budding yeast have a mother cell and a daughter cell that grows upon the mother cell. And this particular budding yeast cell has been stained with rhodamine phylloidin to reveal its actin structures. And so there are two filamentous actin structures that are present in an interphase budding yeast cell. There are these actin cables, which act as tracks to transport many organelles and other materials from the mother cell to the daughter cell. And then there are these actin patches. And we now know that these actin patches are sites of clathrin-mediated endocytosis. But I want to tell you today about the studies that revealed the function of these cortical patches and then how we've used budding yeast to, just to work out some new principles um, uh, governing the behavior and function of, of uh, clathrin-mediated endocytosis. And so we and uh, um, others started studying these patches in budding yeast after Kilmartin, Adams, and Pringle first saw them by immunofluorescence. And we decided to take the microscopy down to an ultrastructural level and do immuno-EM. And this is an electron micrograph that John Mulholland made of one of these cortical patches. And it's immunogold stain for actin. And what this micrograph shows is that these cortical patches are actually invaginations in the plasma membrane that are coated with actin. Now, at the time that John saw these, we didn't know whether these structures, these invaginations, were endocytic sites or maybe exocytic sites. Uh, you could have gotten a similar structure by either types of process. Or maybe they were some kind of signaling um, or stress sensing structure. We didn't know the function. But we and others were doing studies in yeast to begin to investigate the actin cytoskeleton. And through genetics, two hybrid screens, and so on and so forth, a number of patch proteins were being identified. And these proteins all seemed to be part of an interacting network because they had interactions with each other um, uh, that, we, that were seen both as physical interactions and as genetic interactions. But still, we didn't know the functions. Some of the um, proteins, though, that we found in this network had really intriguing activities. So four of the proteins, those shown by red stars, are all activators of the ARP2-3 complex that I talked about in the first video in this, in this series. Um, other proteins, curiously, were components of the endocytic pathway, which was somewhat surprising because at the time, actin and endocytosis were not known to have anything to do with each other. So when Marco Kexonen started working in my lab on this problem, he decided to try to work out the relationships between these proteins in this network. And so what he did is he did two-color imaging, tagging different components in this network with either green fluorescent protein or red fluorescent protein and making movies. And I should say that both the um, Cooper lab and the Botstein lab had made single-color movies of actin patch proteins in budding yeast and had revealed that the patches are, re are remarkably dynamic. They were forming and moving around and disappearing. They had rather short, short lifetimes. When Marco came and started doing two-color imaging, he pushed the analysis a little further and gained a number of insights from, from his analysis. So the first thing that was key was that he did two-color imaging. And here, he's labeled uh, an endocytic adapter protein in green and an actin cytoskeletal protein in red. And if you just look at a static image like this, what you see are some red patches, some green patches, and a few yellow patches. And if you look at that, it suggests that maybe there are three different kinds of structures on the cortex of the yeast cell. Maybe there are some that have just uh, the endocytic protein, the green ones, some that have just acted in the red ones, and a few that are yellow that have both proteins together. But what was really going on was revealed when Marco imaged these two different proteins in real time. And so when you do that, what you see is that every patch, when it's first born, is green. And invariably, that patch, after a short time, will turn yellow. Okay? And then at the end of its lifetime, it will turn red. 
when the patch turns yellow, in other words, when actin starts to assemble on the patch, it starts to move, as though forces from actin assembly might be moving this patch into the interior of the cell. Um, Marco did, in addition to doing two color analysis, one of the very important things that he did was to use medial focal planes in his analysis. And this allowed him just to look at the events that are happening at the surface of the cell, looking from the side. And because he did that, um, he, he was able to see that as these patches were forming, they were moving off the surface of the cell into the cell. And one of the key analytical tools that he used was to make chymographs, okay? And so what that means is that if he takes a single patch on the surface, forming on the surface of the cell, and draws a line where that patch forms, and then samples that line in every frame of a movie, and then lines up all these uh, lines from the entire movie here, you can see for the full lifetime of the green protein, the endosig adapter, that it forms on the surface of the cell, and then it starts to move off the surface. Going down means moving into the interior of the cell. That's why you get this hook shape. And that happens exactly when the actin begins to assemble at the endocytic... at this site, which we now know is an endocytic site. When actin assembles, this um, chymograph curves into the cell. And when you merge the two, you get this sort of candy corn figure where you see the green stripe, which represents the patch, st sitting stationary on the surface of the membrane, and then it turns yellow when actin begins to assemble, and then it starts to leave the membrane and enter into the cytoplasm when actin begins to assemble. You can see that very dramatically in this, um, in this short movie, in which Marco is just looking at the SLA1 endocytic adapter, and he's looking at a number of these events on the surface. And then what he's done over here is he's um, made a green dot every time a patch is born, and a red dot every time the patch has disappeared. And so every patch is born on the surface of the cell, and then it takes a small step into the interior of the cell. That happens every single time. And so the dimensions... Here we see uh, one of these traces, but at higher time resolution, where you can see more time points. It starts at the surface of the cell, it moves into the cell, and the dimensions of that movement are exactly the same dimensions as the endocytic invaginations that we'd seen at the plasma membrane. This is an electron micrograph by Kent McDonald at Berkeley. Okay. So, putting this together, we looked originally at um, six or seven different proteins doing different permutations of two-color imaging. We were able to develop a model. And what we think that... what we proposed that we were looking at were individual endocytic events. And so, what was happening was, out of the sort of disorder and randomness of the cytoplasm, an endocytic site was beginning to... to assemble, and it would continue to assemble over time. And then there would be a burst of actin assembly that actin assembly would generate a force. That force would invaginate the membrane, pinch off a vesicle, and then finally, some of the endocytic proteins would disappear, and we'd see the vesicle enter into the cytoplasm. Okay. So what happens to these vesicles once they pinch off from the membrane? Well, Junko Toshima, a postdoc later in the lab, worked out a nice method in which she could fluorescently label the pheromone alpha factor that's taken up by endocytosis, and she could use that to label um, these early endosomes in red. And when we looked at the green endocytic vesicles, you can see here that they are very efficiently being trafficked from the cell surface to the early endosome. And then the daughter cell, there's a really remarkable behavior where the endosome seems to actually know where the vesicles are, and it goes out and collects them almost like a vacuum cleaner, vacuuming up, up the vesicles. And Junko went on to show that all of this communication between the vesicles and the endosomes is occurring on actin cables in the cytoplasm. Okay. So what about actin? So here we've seen that actin is assembling in yeast at the endocytic sites. Um, but what is the function of actin? And so here Marco has made a chymograph by making a line through a wild-type uh, untreated yeast cell. And then over here you can see a chymograph where you can see multiple endocytic events. And so each of these is... time is going from left to right, you can see that the endocytic site forms, and then the coat moves off the surface into the interior of the cell. But when Marco treated these cells with Latrunculin A to block actin assembly, what happened is that endocytosis was completely blocked. There was no internalization, and the patch never disassembled. So actin assembly was required for this internalization step of endocytosis, 
and it was required for the disassembly of these actin endocytic patch structures. So this left us with the view then that what's happening is that as an endocytic site's forming, there are proteins that accumulate that can nucleate the assembly of uh, actin filaments. And then some of the actin filaments attach themselves to the coat. There are proteins in the coat that we know, like SLA2, that bind to actin filaments. Um, Marco showed in other experiments that actin is occurring at the plasma membrane and then flexing into the cell. And so what we proposed is that assembly forces are driving the vesicle into the cell by pulling off an invagination. And there's also a role, an essential role, for my, a, a, a so-called type 1 uh, unconventional myosin in this process. Okay, so further analysis, um, one thing that Marco noticed is that when he looked at different proteins that were tagged with GFP, different cortical patch proteins that were all connected in the same pathway, he could find different classes of behaviors. So some proteins, like this protein called LAST17, which happens to be the yeast wasp, the protein that activates the ARP23 complex, it appeared and disappeared on the surface of the cell, but never moved off the surface. This endocytic coat protein assembled on the surface of the cell, and then it moved a short distance into the cell before it disassembled. That's shown here in this trace. And then finally, when you tag a marker for actin, it appears on the surface of the cell, and then it moves a great distance into the cytoplasm uh, when it assembles. And so by looking subsequently at lots of, of uh, papers, uh, at lots of proteins, um, we could find uh, a number of different classes of behaviors. So there were some proteins that never moved off the surface. Some came to the surface and moved a short way into the cell and disappeared. Some came, uh, assembled on the surface and moved very rapidly into the cell and then disappeared. And others moved a long distance into the cell. And then when you looked at what proteins had these behaviors, it was clear that there was sort of a modular design to the endocytic pathway where the proteins that arrived on the surface of the cell and then moved slowly into the cell were the proteins that made up the coat of the endocytic vesicle. The proteins that stayed on the surface of the cell and never moved in were the proteins that nucleated actin assembly and that generated forces on actin. The proteins that arrived late in the pathway, right when the vesicle was starting to, to internalize, when the invagination was forming, were Proteins, so-called bar proteins, I'll come back to, which um, bind to curved membranes. We think they were attracted by the curvature of the membrane that formed as it invaginated. And finally, the actin proteins ride with the vesicle deeply into the cytoplasm. So this was nice because in this subsequent, the first pap paper was by, uh, by Kaxon and Son um, and Drubin and uh, defined the process. And in this next paper, they, um, we looked at lots of different proteins, something like 60 different proteins in this pathway, and it became really clear that we could group them together, which was very convenient for starting to understand the functions of this pathway, because it's easier to think about maybe four or five modules and how they're functioning than it is to try to think about how 60 different proteins are functioning in this pathway. Another really interesting observation that Marco made was that when he looked at the... Um, the appearance and disappearance, the kinetics of appearance and disappearance of a given protein. Here he's looking at this actin binding protein with four different traces from different patches. They were almost superimposable. And if you looked at a different protein, this endocytic coat protein, at the kinetics of its appearance and disappearance, the fluorescence intensity increase and decrease, they were almost superimposable. So the process was remarkable, remarkably uh, um, uh, reproducible and regular in the kinetics. And so, in subsequent work with uh, the theoretician George Oster, we came up with ideas for what could make this pathway so regular and why it wasn't more noisy than it is. And we thought that maybe because the, if the uh, biochemical reactions were coupled to the chemical react, to the, to the membrane curvature, then that could serve as a buffer and make the whole process more regular than it, than it might otherwise be. Okay, another really interesting feature of this pathway was that there are all these actin regulators I talked about in one of the first slides, and that each of them was recruited with a distinct kinetics. And so here we're looking at the fluorescence, fluorescence intensity over time of different regulators, many of which are activators of the ARP23 complex, or here's a myosin. 
And you can see that they're coming with distinct kinetics at distinct times, which suggests that there's some really interesting complexity in how these different proteins are regulating actin and regulating the functions of the endocytic machinery. Okay. So, with all this um, analysis of this, this new endocytic pathway in budding yeast, an important question that was still unanswered was what sort of endocytic pathway is this? There's more than a half dozen types of endocytic pathways known in mammalian cells. Was this uh, one of those pathways? And the most obvious question asked, is this a pathway for clathrin-mediated endocytosis? So, clathrin um, is involved in several trafficking events in cells, which makes it a little bit confusing to look at by uh, GFP tagging, for example. But what we did is we looked at the clathrin using total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy, which is a technique that just allows you to see what's happening at the surface of the cell. We didn't know if that would work in yeast cells, but it actually worked really well, so the cell wall didn't get in the way. And this is a chymograph looking at a number of different endocytic events. And so here you see at the surface of the cell, you can see different um, events where clathrin came to the surface, and then different events where there was a burst of actin assembly. And if you merge the two, you see that clathrin is on the surface of the cell, and it's punctuated by a burst of actin assembly, and then the two proteins disappear together. So clearly, this was a pathway for clathrin-mediated endocytosis. And so this was shown um, both in my lab and in the lab of Sandy uh, Lemon um, at around the same time. Okay. And if we did the same trick of inhibiting actin assembly, looking at clathrin by turf microscopy, normally in the controls, the clathrin comes and goes as in vesicles are forming. But if we treat the cells with latrunculin A and block actin assembly, we stabilize clathrin on the surface of the cell. So it's a pathway for clathrin-mediated endocytosis, and it's dependent on actin assembly. Okay. So now we've defined this pathway and described the um, very regular behavior of the different proteins that are recruited in the pathway. But what about their functions? And really, the motivation for doing all this in yeast in the first place is that we have genetics, and we can make mutations in everything. And so, Marco Caxonin and Chris Terre made um, cells that had GFP-labeled endocytic adapter and RFP-labeled actin protein uh, expressed in something like 60 different mutants and looked at them. And here's a sample of some of, the, their, some of their data. And they saw lots of different phenotypes. Some were really obvious, where it was very hard to see endocytic patches forming. Some formed huge endocytic patches, um, and so on and so forth. And so one way in which you can um, analyze these defects at, at, um, that's very informative is to um, make chymographs again, okay? So a wild-type endocytic event has a very distinct signature where, again, the, when in a chymograph, the coat forms on the surface, actin assembles, and it moves... The, together, they move off the surface into the cell. If you start to look in mutants and make chymographs, you can start to, to learn a lot about what the proteins that um, you've mutated are doing. So, for example, there are a number of proteins that, when we mutated them, they altered the internalization of the coat complex. So if we mutated a protein called capping protein, the, uh, the whole complex moved very slowly into the cell. If we mutated the fibrin gene, SAC6, it was really interesting. The endocytic site would form. There'd still be a burst of actin assembly, but then there's no internalization. So actin assembles normally, but fibrin is a crosslinker that crosslinks the network together. Without that crosslinking, there's no endocytic internalization. A really interesting phenotype was this bar protein, RVS-167. When we mutated this protein, what happened is the endocytic vesicle starts to internalize, but then something goes wrong, and instead of internalizing, it snaps back to the plasma membrane. And we interpret that as a defect in scission, and that this bar protein was essential for driving vesicle scission. Um, there were proteins that were... Uh, played a role in the disassembly of the actin network, and then there are proteins that were important for the initiation of actin assembly. And uh, further studies of SLA1 and N3 have found, in fact, that those proteins are central to recruiting the endocytic complex, um, the endocytic actin complex to the endocytic site. And I'll get back to that in the fourth um, segment in this series. Okay. So putting this all together, then, we came up with this idea of sort of a modular design of the endocytic pathway. 
where, based on function and the kinetics and timing of when proteins are recruited, we could group the proteins as coat proteins, which we could subdivide into early and late, the sort of myosin-wasp complex or module, which nucleates actin and generates forces on it, an escission complex, and then finally all the actin machinery that arrived very late in the process. Okay, so the next question we wanted to ask using genetics and using this system, which very sensitively allowed us to analyze endocytic events, was how the endocytic membrane geometry is, genera is generated and then how is it stabilized. And so um, our initial studies with John Mulholland were done by chemical fixation and subsequently Christopher Booser came and started doing high pressure freezing and, and freeze substitution in the lab. And he saw um, these beautiful flask shaped endocytic structures in the cell and you could see now, you can see the clathrin coat very clearly on these endocytic structures and you can see a clear zone around each of the endocytic structures where the actin is displacing ribosomes from the area around the endocytic invagination. Now each of these sites had a very clear sort of flask shape and we were really interested where it was wide at the base, narrow in the middle, and then wide at the, at the vesicle region again, in how that shape was generated. And there were some really good candidates known that might have been generating this shape. And these are the so-called bar proteins. Bar proteins are these banana-shaped dimeric proteins that have a really interesting property and in that they bind specifically to curved membranes. Okay, and they had been implicated in sculpting membranes. And so we wanted to see if we could use this system to test for the functions of bar proteins. And so in this pathway, there was a so-called bar protein, which, has, which binds to membranes of very high curvature. And then another protein, a so-called F-bar protein, that binds to membranes of lower curvature. And so what Takuma Kishimoto did is to tag the F-bar protein called BZZ1 and the bar protein called RVS-167 uh, together with um, RFP and GFP in the same cell. And what he found was really interesting. The F-bar protein arrived first in this chymograph and it never moved off the surface into the cell. The, this is a protein that binds to wide to uh, membranes of low curvature. And then the bar protein, which binds to proteins of high curvature, to binds to membranes of high curvature, comes later and leaves the membrane almost immediately when it arrives and goes into the cell. And from this, what we proposed is that the F-bar protein, which binds curved membranes of low curvature, um, is sh shown in yellow here, that this generates a base for the assembly of an endocytic site. And then when actin assembles and starts to pull the membrane into the cell, this, this generates this tubule of, cur of uh, um, that then is a binding site for these bar proteins, which can then come and squeeze down the membrane. And so uh, we could test these ideas by making mutants. And so Takuma worked together with uh, Christopher Busser, the electron microscopist, and did really careful quantitative electron microscopy of cells expressing the um, uh, just wild type cells, cells that were mutant in the bar protein. Interestingly, those proteins had really wide invaginations. When we looked at mutants that were mutant in the F-bar protein, we found that the base of the endocytic invagination was wider. And when we made a double mutant lacking both, we got invaginations that were very, had wide bases and wide tubules. And so from this, we concluded that as the burst of actin assembly occurs, it starts the, um, first there's a base that's built out of this F-bar protein, BZZ1, the actin starts to assemble. It pulls in an invagination. This curvature creates binding sites for the bar proteins. As the bar proteins bind and polymerize, they pinch down the membrane into a narrow tubule and mediate fission. Remember I told you when we deleted the gene for the bar protein, fission often failed and the site snapped back to the membrane surface. And this model is consistent with the phenotypes we saw in these different mutants. Okay, so one issue that was often raised in the early days of our studies of yeast endocytosis and clathrin mediated endocytosis was whether what was being studied in yeast was relevant to what happens in mammalian cells. And one of the main reasons for questioning the relevance was that in yeast, the endocytic invaginations had this sort of 
long tubular or flask-like shape, whereas in mammalian cells, invaginations, the endocytic sites generally were spherical, okay? But it was kind of puzzling, you know, whether um, to think about why these two processes would be dissimilar, because most of the proteins are conserved from yeast to humans. And in fact, in a paper from Pietro Di, C Di Camilli's lab, Ferguson et al., they showed that if they removed the protein dynamin, which is a GTPase that pinches off vesicles, structures form in mammalian cells that are long tubules coated with bar proteins and actin that look very much like the, pro the structures that we see in yeast. And so I think this is evidence that, in, that the underlying machinery responsible for endocytosis in yeast and in mammalian cells really is the same, and it's working under the same um, sort of principles. Okay, one last interesting observation that was made during these studies had to do with what happened when that F-bar protein was removed. Remember, the F-bar protein, the BZZ1, assembles at the base of the endocytic site, and we think makes a platform on which actin assembles um, to generate the forces to invaginate the membrane. What Takuma noticed is that when he deleted the F-bar protein, BZZ1, that the proteins at the base of the invagination started to move when actin assembled. Normally, there wasn't much movement of endocytic sites in the plane of the membrane, but these sites started to skid along. And so here, we see a coat protein, and as the coat protein internalizes, and the merge is here, as it internalizes, the base of the invagination starts to slide along the membrane. And you can see that in traces here. Normally, if you do a trace of a protein at the base of the endocytic invagination, it doesn't move very much during its lifetime. But if you delete the bar, the F-bar protein, for most of the life of the endocytic site, it doesn't move in the plane of the membrane. But then when actin assembles, it starts to slide along the surface of the membrane. And from that, we proposed that what's happening is that normally, here we've symbolized the F-bar protein in green, it starts to assemble a stable base, and that when actin assembles, it can push against that base and make a stable site. But when we delete the gene for the F-bar protein, we no longer have a stable base, and so as actin starts to generate forces, those forces are not always directed in a coherent manner, and they tend to move the endocytic site around in the plane of the, um, of the endocytic... Uh, of the plasma membrane. Okay. So just to sort of summarize what we've learned about the yeast endocytic pathway. Um, we, along the top of this diagram are the events that um, we think are occurring in the pathway, and those are color-coded with uh, something like 60 different proteins that we've now ordered in this pathway. And so what's really remarkable about the pathway is it has a very um, predictable series of events that occur with predictable timing and predictable order. And we've been able to cluster those uh, proteins in this pathway into modules based on their biochemical activities, their known interactions, and their functions when we make mutations, as well as when they arrive uh, in this process. And um, through these studies, this has given us an opportunity to gain new insights into what individual... many individual proteins are doing in this, in this process. We know that actin is important for internalizing the membrane. We know that these um, RVS proteins, the bar proteins, are important for decision of the membrane and, and come very late. And just sort of a technical point, one of the reasons... I think there's a couple of um, reasons why it's been possible to create such a, um, uh, a rich and detailed um, uh, pathway, to work out such a rich and detailed pathway for endocytosis. One is that in yeast, it's very easy to tag genes um, endogenously by recombinant... Um, by recombination, homologous recombination of the genome, so we can put GFP and RFP um, fusions in the genome without changing the expression level of proteins, so we haven't perturbed the pathway. And the other thing is that although yeast are very small, it's actually much easier to visualize their endocytic events than it is in mammalian cells, and that's because they're spherical, and we're watching these events from the side, and we can actually see the... Um, how the different proteins are organized in time and space in this process by light microscopy. And those two features have made yeast, together, of course, with the famous genetics, a very powerful system for these studies. And so here I have listed the people whose work was highlighted in this uh, presentation on endocytosis and yeast. 
And next I'll talk about our studies on endocytosis in mammalian cells.